Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts, and welcome to another Angry Bulletin. There have been rumors swirling around at Cape Canaveral regarding the status of Dream Chaser. It's been some time since Dream Chaser arrived at the Cape, supposedly to carry out some final tests, and after that, it was going to be put on top of the second Vulcan Centaur rocket for its flight to orbit and a rendezvous with the International Space Station where it would be carrying out a resupply mission. However, as we all know, that didn't happen. Instead, Vulcan Centaur flew with a dummy payload on board, and aside from a minor incident with a solid rocket booster, which, by the way, wouldn't have affected the disposition of Dream Chaser had it actually been on the rocket at the time, the mission still would have gone just as expected. Well, because of this, a lot of people have started to wonder exactly what's happening with Dream Chaser and why we're experiencing these kinds of delays. And also, a little while ago, Sierra Space announced that Dream Chaser would not be flying until May at the earliest, May of 2025. This is at least another six-month delay over and above about a year delay that Sierra Space had already experienced with this spacecraft. And so now the questions are beginning to swirl. Is Dream Chaser experiencing technical problems? Are there some issues with the testing that didn't go as expected? And if this is indeed the case, what about the human-rated Dream Chaser that was supposed to come out in around 2026 or so? That doesn't even seem remotely possible at this point. And if that is indeed the case... Does Starliner remain NASA's only alternative for a backup human-rated spacecraft Dragon, which they absolutely need? Is Dream Chaser even going to be ready to carry astronauts up to space before the International Space Station is deorbited in 2030? And if not... Is Dream Chaser even going to be ready to carry astronauts by 2030 when a replacement space station is going to be in orbit? Of course, the question that everybody really wants answered is, what really is going on? Well, yesterday I notified Sierra Space that I was going to be making a story about this topic and didn't have a whole lot of information. It was going to be mostly speculation. And to my amazement, Sierra Space's head of public relations called me directly directly on the phone to give me quite a lot of interesting information. And I'm going to share all of that with you right now. So if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I feel that NASA made an enormous mistake in investing over $4 billion in Starliner as opposed to investing in Dream Chaser as the alternative to Crew Dragon, something that Sierra Space has been working on for a considerable amount of time and I think that they're going to demonstrate very soon is a much better spacecraft than Starliner could ever be. However, Dream Chaser's configuration and mission had to change when NASA decided not to invest money in the crew-rated version of the spacecraft, and so now Dream Chaser is a resupply ship, at least currently, the DC-100 version as it is called, a spacecraft that has secured six resupply missions to the International Space Station under the Commercial Resupply Service 2 contract, or CRS-2. But why? Why did NASA do this? Doesn't NASA already have lots of resupply ships? They've got the Cygnus, they've got the SpaceX Dragon. Why do they need a third resupply ship? Well, it's because Dream Chaser is capable of a wide variety of missions that these other spacecraft are not, because it's essentially a mini space shuttle, and that gives it lots of advantages. In addition to that, it's actually two spacecraft in one. Instead, Instead of carrying a service module, as most resupply ships do, it carries an independent spacecraft called the Shooting Star. 
The Shooting Star has its own propulsion system, its own solar panels, its own maneuvering capabilities. It can essentially carry out a wide variety of missions on its own without using Dream Chaser at all. And it's also capable of carrying larger cargo items than either Cygnus or Dragon. And because Dream Chaser is essentially a mini space shuttle, when it re-enters the atmosphere, the G-forces on this spacecraft are a lot more gentle, about one and a half Gs as opposed to six to eight Gs for a spacecraft like Dragon. Also, it doesn't have to splash down, meaning that it can carry much more sensitive cargoes, and they can carry these cargoes directly to a laboratory as long as that laboratory is in close proximity to a conventional landing strip. As long as you have a landing strip that can handle, say, a 737 or something along those lines, it can also handle Dream Chaser. But even though Sierra Space didn't get funding from NASA to build a human-rated Dream Chaser, that hasn't stopped them from investing hundreds of millions of dollars in the DC-200, a Dream Chaser capable of carrying four to six crew members, plus the Shooting Star as well, meaning that this is a spacecraft capable of carrying at least four and a half tons worth of cargo, plus crew up to a space station, giving it capabilities that no current spacecraft has. Indeed, this is the kind of capability that the space shuttle used to have, but for a fraction of the price. A very exciting prospect, but again, it looks like that it's going to be on the distant horizon. Right now, Dream Chaser Tenacity, together with Dream Chaser Reverence, known as DC-102, which is under construction in Denver, are both dedicated to resupply missions. Although only a half dozen or so have been contracted by NASA, at least up to this point. Of course, NASA is going to need resupply missions for the replacement to ISS, so there's definitely a lot of money in this, but Sierra Space absolutely wants a one-stop shop spacecraft. A spacecraft capable of carrying both cargo and crew up to their life module space station that they've been working on for quite some time. And it seems that Sierra Space has been experiencing a number of delays. Now, the current estimate is a launch of Tenacity no earlier than May of 2025. But there have been some other issues as well. Rumors swirled at NASA while I paid a visit under a press pass recently that some NASA technicians and engineers are concerned about what Dream Chaser is going to do to the landing field at Cape Canaveral, the landing strip that was originally used by the space shuttle. As you're going to see here, this is a very, very well-engineered landing strip that NASA values very highly, and some are a bit nervous about letting this spacecraft land for the first time on this precisely engineered tarmac, especially given the fact that Dream Chaser has a landing skid rather than a landing wheel on the nose. Also, this is not the only problem that Sierra Space is experiencing with the government at the moment when it comes to this first mission. The was started in 1973, finished up in 1976. It cost about $26 million for the concrete alone, just what you're seeing all the land and road work that built the runway. It works out to about $100 million today. Uh, so uh, it's been said it was the best runway we did had to build in 1976, probably still the best runway we know how to build today, actually. What you're seeing is the original concrete. It's not been resurfaced. It's not been changed. This is about 50-year-old concrete. And also, it's it's not the biggest. Everybody always wonders, is the biggest? So the longest in the U.S. is the Denver at 16,000 feet. This is 15,000 feet long. It's actually 15,001 feet long to get that extra. They were the biggest for a while. Um, so and we're not to the middle yet. Come on. We're still going. <laughs> uh, so 15,000 feet long. Longest in the U.S. is Denver at 16,000. I think the longest in the world right now is in Tibet at 18,000 because of the altitude. Um, what is unique about this though now is the fact it's 300 feet wide. So most big runways are 150 feet wide. A big military runway might be 200 feet wide. This is 300. So from the light to light, the football field across this runway. Uh, and again, out here, things lose all perspective. You know, everything's big and it's hard to tell how big things are. Where am I going? Where did I make it? Right here. 
so it's hard to tell what big really is. In the concrete alone, it's about 110 acres of concrete, just in this concrete, not in the asphalt road, not in anything around it. 16 inches thick solid, two feet of compacted soil cement underneath that. There's also a two degree, or excuse me, a two foot slope from the center to the edge. Where you're standing right now is two feet higher than where you started from. So the lights you see on the stalks right there next to the bus, the globe on that light, is the same height as you are right now. You don't believe me because it doesn't look that way. Go back over there and look down at the light and you'll see it lines up perfectly with the top right here. So there's about a one and a half degree slope, percent slope rather, on the runway this way. The runway, all with, the whole thing used to be grooved like this. These are standard grooves. It's a high friction surface. First made that touchdown. If there was any side load, a little bit of wind, kick the rudder a little bit. The runway wants to grab the tire, the tire wants to grab the runway. It was tearing tires up a little bit. Uh, so what they did was they actually ground 3,500 feet in both directions. So they have brought diamond grinders out here and ground this down smooth. And that's what you see right there is the smooth part. Now the, the grooves are in here for drainage. Uh, but we realized we're never going to land in the rain anyway. We didn't need the drainage. So you land on the smooth part, you got a little flex, you can slide just a little bit if you need to. By the time you hit this, who cares at that point, you slow down, that will not make a difference. But what you're looking at right here, we actually etched this also. So the blue mark is the center line of the nose wheel. So STS-135, last shuttle flight ever. The center line of the nose wheel is right here, nose pointing this way, pointing to the south. So you can effectively say, I know it's not technically correct, but effectively that's where the shuttle program came to an end. That's where the last one stopped flying, the last operational flight motion stopped right there. So kind of a, kind of a neat spot, kind of a sad spot too, that we actually are not flying anymore still. Uh, in the white paint, there are glass beads to make it reflective. When they repainted this back in 2006, they put 18,000 pounds of glass beads in the white paint. So again, numbers kind of lose perspective. Um, I would hate to think what it'd take to replace this runway now with one across the concrete. One of the neat things about it is, as you look down that way, there's 11,500 feet of concrete that way, 3,500 feet of concrete behind you. But the neat thing about it is, is when they built this, the story goes, they got the concrete built, and again, this is in the middle of a Florida swamp. They actually used survey equipment, checked it out, it was less than 10 thousandths of an inch difference end to end, elevation wise. We actually resurveyed it about two years ago, and it was a quarter inch difference end to end. So after about 40 years of sitting in the swamp, there's only a quarter inch difference over 15,000 feet of concrete. And it just goes to show when you want to do something, and you got that money, you can do it. And it's amazing what we can do that this is still a big slab of concrete in the middle of a swamp, and it's still a quarter inch difference over 15,000 feet. So, can, can you tell us about, because um, this runway is about to be used again by Sierra Space, can you tell us a little bit about that, what you've heard about Dream Chaser, how's that going to be different from the shuttle? So, well, it's unmanned, it's un uncrewed, uh, and um, so Dream Chaser is going to be the first time a spacecraft has landed here for the first time. With, with the, with the or orbiters, that was all in California the first time, X-37, it was in California the first time. So this is the first time we're going to be the actual first place to land, so that's a unique thing for us. Uh, that's going to be an FAA license regulated activity, so I know Sierra right now is going through the process with the FAA for the approvals. Space Florida has to approve it, and we have to approve it also. Uh, you know, as long as they meet all the all the, uh, the safety requirements and everything that, that NASA range safety and the FAA range safety folks say they need to do, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're good with it. So did you hear it? The three letters that are the bane of every space flight enthusiast's existence right now, FAA. And yes, even though Sierra Space has been planning this mission for years now, the FAA has not yet issued Sierra Space a license. You think that SpaceX is running into problems right now? Sierra Space and organizations like them, for example, Varda Space, that had to keep their little bitty spacecraft in orbit for eight months. They couldn't land the thing in the middle of the desert because of the FAA. It appears that Sierra Space is running into similar problems. Indeed, SpaceX is getting much quicker action on the part of the FAA, given the fact that they are trying to launch and land the largest rocket in human history less than 10 kilometers away from heavily populated regions, whereas Sierra Space will be landing something a lot smaller than a commercial airliner at Cape Canaveral. Yes, it will be passing over populated areas, but still, 
far less dangerous than the space shuttle ever was, yet they have still not been awarded an FAA license to land at the Cape yet. And as far as the May 2025 date is concerned, that's actually the earliest opportunity that NASA says they're going to have for a docking port to be available for Dream Chaser at this stage. Dream Chaser could theoretically fly a lot sooner, although when I had my conversation with Sierra Space's public relations representative, actually the head of their public relations department, he made it very clear that Sierra Space is actually happy to have the additional testing time between now and May. And then as far as NASA's concerns about the landing strip are concerned, Sierra Space is actually going to carry out what's called a drag test with Dream Chaser Tenacity, where they're going to go ahead and drag the spacecraft across the tarmac to make sure that neither the wheels nor the skid are actually going to do any damage. In addition to that, they're also going to carry out multiple firings of the RCS thrusters on this spacecraft to demonstrate their capabilities as well. By the way, Dream Chaser has the capability of reboosting the International Space Station in the same way that the Russian Progress spacecraft can. And to put that into perspective, because I know it's been in the news lately that Dragon can allegedly do the same thing, that Dragon reboost only reboosted the ISS about a half a kilometer total. That is one-sixth of what progress is capable of doing. And overall, that test was only to determine Dragon's resilience when it was pushing at the International Space Station so that the upgraded version of Dragon, designed to deorbit the space station, can be better designed. In my opinion, based on that test, Dragon does not have the same reboost capabilities as the Progress and probably not the Cygnus spacecraft as well, which means having Dream Chase are available for reboost would be a pretty good thing. And here's the most exciting thing of all. That drag test and especially the RCS thruster test, I've just received an invitation to attend that at Cape Canaveral next year. I'll keep you up to date on all of that. So very excited to have that opportunity and very thankful to Sierra Space for offering me that invitation. So having learned all of this new information in my my opinion, there may have been some testing delays with Dream Chasers, some fine tuning I's that needed to be dotted, T's that needed to be crossed, etc. But I don't think the spacecraft has any sort of significant problems. That being the case, though, it's going to be another 18 months before the DC 202 is ready for service, and probably another 18 months after that before the human rated version is ready. And by the way, there's a national security variant called the DC-300 that's being worked on as well, meaning that I think it's going to be around 2028 before we have a human-rated Dream Chaser, and that being the case, I think it's probably a pretty good idea to get Starliner into service anyway, regardless of what sort of problems it might have, simply because NASA didn't invest the necessary funds in a human-rated Dream Chaser when they had the chance, and this is the problem price we have to pay. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon or PayPal. All the details are in the description. And as always, stay angry about space.